in 2001, I was living in New Mexico, and uh, a friend of mine had told me that there was an opening for a, a producer position at This American Life, my favorite radio show. And so I, I was totally unqualified, I, I, but I wanted to apply for, for, the, for the job. So I, I wrote a cover letter about my love of storytelling, and then I was struggling with the resume portion because, um, you know, I, I just, I, I'd never had a job in radio. I'd never had a real job before. And almost as a joke, a sad joke to myself, I did a very earnest and truthful resume where I talked about the real jobs I'd had, ticket scalping, marijuana salesman, all this stuff like that. And so I, I, I mailed that in as like a, a, I thought it might entertain somebody at WBEZ. And three days later on my, vo on my answering machine, I guess we had those back then, on my answering machine was Ira Glass. And, and he's like doing his thing, you know, is stuttering, you know, I, 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 we, we want to interview you for the show. We want to we wanna interview you about the job. So I was sh shocked and uh, called my brother just so he could listen to the voicemail. And this is so awesome. What the hell is insane? Um, so they interviewed three people, I learned later. They interviewed three people for, for one job. They hired both of the other two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of them was Jonathan Goldstein, who uh, he's known as Canada's Ira Glass. He hosts a show called Wiretap in Canada. He worked at This American Life for years. And uh, the other is, has become a really good friend of mine over the years. Um, and her name is Starly Kine. And uh, she's done some of, the, some of my favorite pieces on This American Life. After a difficult breakup, she got Phil Collins to help her kind of sort through uh, how, to, how to deal with this and how to you know, find healing. Um, so she and her friend uh, and, and colleague Melinda Shopson, they're working on a brand new, uh, I'll just say a brand new project that I'm so excited about. And I, I can't wait to see it come to life. But they're going to come up here and share a story with you right now. So give a big round of applause to Starly and Melinda. Come on up, you guys. I didn't, I didn't remember. I don't think I ever, I didn't remember that. I'm sure I knew. But I don't know why Ira called you himself. That's confusing. That, I feel like that part is true. No one else had a phone. Um, I made a better producer. It's good they hired me. Um, <laughs> it's good. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Starly. Hi, this is Melinda. We have a we, <laughs> we opted for the shared mic because the headset seemed awkward, more awkward than this, right? True. Um, we wanted we well. There's like, we're, obs it's frustrating, right? Because we have something that we, we have like the most ideal scenes that got away stories, yeah? Yeah, that they involve private detectives and license plates looking up and stakeouts and lots of very exciting things. Yeah, like calling in favors from cops and famous pop stars. There's, we have, we have, we have stories that would make everyone here feel very bad about themselves for not having these stories. They're so good. But, really, like everybody would just leave the festival and go home and try to like live better lives and more adventurous lives just to try to compare, compete with these stories. But we actually can't tell you any of those stories because we haven't announced this project yet. But they really are very on theme, that part, right? Yeah, and I, I think that probably actually will qualify as the scene that got away. The, this would have been amazing. You're the, um, you, you guys are, are the scene that got the away scene because, got away. like, the reactions you would have to these stories would be a scene in itself. And we can't even capture it because we can't tell you it for that to happen. So we have to, like, go into our past to talk about our, our individual past. Yeah. Because she's my producer on this project that we can't yet tell you that. I can't wait till you guys retroactively remember being here when this project comes out and it will all make sense and you'll feel, and you guys, and for the record, you can still take credit. When you know about it, you can still tell people you were in the know without being in the know. You didn't know you were in the know, but you can still say you were in the know, okay? You're absorbing it. You can, I'll let you guys do that when you know. You already know, but one day you will know that you know, is what I'm saying. So we want to tell about our individual scenes that got away, right? Yeah. Am I going first? Yeah. 
You're, you're gonna tell about your biggest scene that got away. Okay, well my first biggest, this is the biggest scene. But, um, up till now. Up until now. Uh, well, when I first, I guess like, well before I met Davey, before that, this is why it's so funny you told that story, because when I tell this story, you're gonna be even more upset that they hired me as a producer. <laughs> um, so I was an intern at This American Life, and I was really, I was like a really, I, I feel like I was a really adored intern, and uh, <laughs> I was. <laughs> and I, and there's at least, yeah, and so the, and, um, but, uh, so then I was an intern, and, and then I went back, I was an intern in Chicago, went back to New York, and really wanted to do a story for This American Life. I'd never done a story. And I pitched the story about, my aunt's dad had died and I went to his funeral, and, it, and this was like in, in 2000. So I went to the funeral and there was, it was in Hollywood, and uh, at the funeral they played like a movie of his life at the funeral. And I guess, I feel like maybe even now that's kind of a crazy thing. I was gonna say that was like pre-internet just happening all the time, but it still was pretty crazy. So we went to this, I went to this funeral, they played this movie of his life, at this funeral parlor called Hollywood Forever which is now like a really big hipster event thing in LA. Val, Val Kilmer does one man shows there and stuff. I feel like I was ahead of the curve with Hollywood forever. Um, uh, I pitched a story about how there's like these movies being made at funerals in Hollywood and how it's such a Hollywood thing. And This American Life said yes, probably because I was such an adored intern. And uh, so I went and I had never done a reported piece and like they had a producer fly out to LA with me and I got, I bought my kit. I bought, it, I, I bought a kit on eBay. It was just like the kit This American Life used. And she, so we each had our own kit. And we were taping and taping and taping. And it was like this terrible thing at first because we were tape. I, I had pitched this story and the, all the tape we were getting in the beginning was pretty boring. And it wasn't good. And I was feeling really nervous that I had pitched it wrong and I had embellished it. And didn't, it wasn't the story that I had said it was going to be. And I could feel like the producer getting... I don't. I felt like now I understand as a producer <laughs> like what it means to feel like frustrated when the story is not working. But at the time, she just seemed like she was being very short with me and trying to be encouraging. But it was like just such boring tape. And then finally, we went and talked to the head of Hollywood Forever, and he's like this incredibly handsome, like handsome in like a different time. Like he looks like he should be in black and white, kind of handsome. Um, and. He is going through his photo albums. He's talking about like starting the how the how being a funeral director has made him. The movies that they showed at the funerals were called scrapbooks, and he was it made him think about his own memories and like how he wanted to be represented, how he died, and then we're looking at the scrapbook, and then suddenly there's a picture of him and this like big his dad and this big fish they're holding, and then he tells us he like looks at that fish, and then he tells this whole story about how that day his mom had found a letter that his girlfriend had written him saying like trying to convince him that he wasn't gay. And his mom had found it, and she had sent him on this fishing trip with his dad to like, for his dad also to convince him he wasn't gay. And he gets really choked up, and it's really emotional, and then it segues into this thing about how he then went to New York after that and realized, like, and it was during the AIDS crisis, it was during like the eight when everyone was dying of AIDS, and people were celebrating, like the funerals were unlike anything he'd ever seen, like they'd throw parties and they'd go to clubs, and then he realized a whole different way of celebrating death or commemorating death. And it was like the kind of moment, I remember afterwards we got this tape, he tells the whole story and then my producer looks at me and it feels like, like it's the first time she's like looked me in the eye for two days, <laughs> you know, like she's not, like, and she's like, that's exactly what we want to have happen, that's what makes a story, you got it, you got it. And we went out for a drink and I felt like, it, I, I, I felt like I'd proven myself and then I went home and I was so afraid of like hearing the tape, the bad tape, because I didn't want to hear all the w bad ways I asked questions and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of put it off for a while. And then finally I started to log it and I put the first tape in and I was like logging and then, I mean I was playing and then nothing was happening. And then I was like, oh it must be like the, the wrong side and I put the other side in and it was blank. And I put another tape in and another tape in and everything we'd recorded was blank because the eBay recorder had been a dud. It didn't work. It might have well been made of styrofoam. It didn't record anything. And it was the worst, it was so, it was so obviously the worst feeling. And, and also I'd like put off the tape, so like it was like, I also got really, you know, you get, 
I couldn't like, like it was, I, I couldn't say, oh, I've been logging for weeks because I would have noticed it was blank and stuff. And I called This American Life, and I remember Ira was really, he was really, really understanding, and he said the same thing had happened to him when he first started out, probably on like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what he real to real machines or something. Just kidding, he's very useful, but. Um, <laughs> But he was really understanding, and it was like incredible, and I couldn't believe it, and he told me, like, that's kind of what you have to go through, and it happens to everyone, and he was much more upset that I'd, like, put off logging, and, um, and I still got uh, hired over Davey, so I feel, <laughs> but, um, and then we actually went back, and Ira and I went back to L.A. and re-reported that story, and he did it, and the guy, I guess, probably, I guess, he told the story again, because he's, I guess, funeral directors are very good at retelling stories. Uh, but that was my, that was like my very first scene that I both got and that got away. My scene, that, the first scene that I got was also the scene that got away. So prior to working with Starley, I worked with the director Eugene Jarecki on and off for the last, oh my God, it's embarrassing, 15 years. Um, and the, the first film, I worked on with him was called The Trials of Henry Kissinger. It was actually the first documentary I ever worked on. Um, thank you. And uh, it, was, it, was the, it was based on a book written by Christopher Hitchens. And one of the first shoots I went on, I was so excited. We were, I was going to get to meet Christopher Hitchens. It's uh, like, you know, getting to know Eugene and really amazing, going to D.C., like so exciting. And so Eugene was in D.C., and I was coming down with the cameraman, and I had all the, the gear and everything, and I, I was on the train, and all of a sudden, I started to feel awful. It was incredibly sick. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to blow this. I'm going to totally blow this. I'm totally sick. And somehow I managed with the cameraman to get all the gear and everything to Christopher Hitchens' house, and there was Eugene. Yay, so great to see you. And I shake Christopher Hitchens' hand, I get introduced, and he's so nice. And I literally have to say to him, like, I have to lay down. Um, and so he's like, oh, here's, here's a seti, of course. Because that's what's in my house, my like beautiful DC townhouse. Um, and I, I lay down, and then Christopher Hitchens comes to me on bended knee, and he says, this will make you feel better. And it's a giant tumbler of whiskey, like huge, <laughs> like probably like six shots. And um, I think he must have been absolutely right because I don't really remember anything that happened. Um, I vaguely remember a typewriter and a cigarette, the cigarette that was like really the ash was gonna fall, and I was really freaked out about it. And I remember a piano, <laughs> and then <laughs> at one point I. Think I remember Salman Rushdie? <laughs> Could have been a delusion. Um, and so, you know, this, I have no idea what he said. I had no idea what happened. I was running the sound. I was supposed to get the releases. I was, you know, this was my first real shoot on this movie. Um, and I had only done commercials before this. And so I, I, don't really know what happened, but I woke up the next day in the hotel. I had all the equipment. I checked the sound, the sound worked. I had the releases. Um, I saw Eugene, and he said, you know, Hitchens thought you were very charming. <laughs> and so, and it was all there, so I kind of think it's an amazing testament to what a great producer I am, that even though I didn't remember the scene, it still made it into the movie. Um, and, uh, it, I, I subsequently found out that that actually is the way that Hitchens greets you no matter whether you're sick or healthy. <laughs> so always with the giant whiskey. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the scene that got away from me, but luckily not from the movie. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Mary. Give it up for Starley and Melinda. Woo!